hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dave Fuhr with GRIT. I can actually feel my heart racing right now because not only is this topic incredibly important to me, but the timing of this session is remarkably important. I'm a cancer survivor and a bereaved cancer caregiver to my father. I became an advocate in 2012 because I needed to become a part of making the future brighter for people who desperately needed it, like I did. You're here because you're an advocate. And whether you've spent your career in advocacy or today is your first time joining the advocacy world, you are a part of making the future brighter for people who need it. During my lifetime, I don't ever remember the need for advocacy being greater than it is right now. In the midst of a global pandemic and threats against our humidity, humanity, we are tackling the issues that affect our communities greatly. But in addition to these emergencies, our healthcare emergencies do not pause. Our community needs do not go away. In fact, the isolation we're experiencing are making some of them worse and creating new ones. During the past few weeks, I've had the honor of speaking to advocacy leaders from 60 organizations around the world. I respect you all tremendously. Many of you are here with us right now. Thank you. The organizations involved in this advocacy exchange and the disease areas we represent account for 15% of the world's population. There are a lot of people facing a lot of issues. One of these advocacy leaders said to me this week, how can we be respectful of the emergencies that are happening around us without losing sight of our own healthcare emergencies? This topic today and the reason it is so important to me is because that is what exactly we are assembled to do. How do we gather? How do we come together? How do we move forward? This is what we will be tackling together on this panel. If I haven't had the chance to connect with you already, or there's more that you wanna share, let's have a conversation. I'll ask Lauren on our team to put my email in the chat function now. So if any of you wanna send me a message, please feel free to connect directly with me. Lauren, Jess, Ben, Christian, Nicole, and everyone on our team with GRIT are the ones who are bringing this advocacy exchange to life. They are our advocates. They are my family, and they are the ones who support our community, just like you support yours. I want to thank Bristol Myers Squibb for supporting this advocacy exchange. Kathy, Jody, and everyone on the BMS team care deeply about elevating our voices, about helping us move advocacy forward together. I also want to thank the Evoke Kind team. They are passionate humans who care about improving survival and quality of life and about making sure the world knows about the work we're doing here together. Our session today is about going virtual. Our panelists, who you'll meet in just a moment, have spent their lives focusing on meeting people where they are. This virtual gathering that you're a part of right now is about coming together. It's about bringing the perspectives from advocacy, academia, industry, and many different fields to tackle the problems we're facing. Coming together is not just about learning. It is about empowering and inspiring each other. But coming together, as our moderator said this week, is actually putting us at greater risk right now because of COVID. We are all trying to find creative ways to gather to share information, to learn, and most importantly, to feel connected. Going virtual is not easy, as many of you know already. What are the barriers? What, are the, what is right for our audiences and our communities? These are the things we'll tackle today to help all of us create meaningful virtual gatherings. And we're excited to have your comments your concern and your perspective throughout the whole session. 
please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to send us messages anytime. In fact, we'd love to hear where you are in the world. Please type in and let us know where you're connecting from. Or you can use the Q&A box to send messages directly to us as panelists only. Last week in our live session, we focused on coalitions and collaborations. That video is available in the auditorium here, as well as all of the recordings from these live sessions. You can come back anytime to access them. At the end of this session, I'll give you a tour around this virtual conference so you can learn more about the functionality. You can see the virtual exhibitor booths from dozens of organizations around the world who are moving healthcare and humanity forward. Each week and after this session, we'll send out a post-session survey. Please let us know your thoughts. Last week, we heard that specific examples are helpful. This week is gonna be chock full of examples to help us create meaningful virtual experiences. The challenges and the journeys that we as patients and that our communities face do not pause. This is why I am honored and humbled to have this time together and for co-creating this advocacy exchange together. We hear your passion and we understand the challenges. We are gonna tackle them together. Now to move into our panel. I just got goosebumps. I've spent the past decade respecting and being amazed by Xuan Gui. He is a leader in digital health and creating new ways to support patients and support communities. Xuan has been named a top healthcare transformer by MM&M and PR Week. He serves on various advisory boards, including Google Health, South by Southwest, and many others. And most importantly to me, Xuan has helped me find my voice and believe in my ability to change the world before I believed it myself. It is my great honor to introduce Xuan Gui, VP and Head of Global Digital Strategy for Bristol Myers Squibb. Thank you very much, David. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And um, I think you missed out one of the advisory boards that I'm on, which is of course Grid Health, which uh, has been an amazing time for me to be able to interact and share uh, experiences with you and really learn from you. Uh, and I will say, Dave, you as, as much of, for me, a hero in my eyes as, uh, as um, everything you said that was so kind about myself as well. So uh, the feeling is mutual, I will say. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today and really glad um, that uh, we were, we're still able to come together despite what's happening in the world these days. Uh, I hope you don't mind a little bit of a lighthearted background that I'm using uh, just to take away the seriousness that we usually feel we're in, in, in the same space all day, every day, looking at a screen. Um, it hopefully will lift your spirits a little bit uh, beyond this conversation, of course. Now, uh, before I, uh, we get started on this panel, I thought we, it would be great to take some time to introduce the panel. For myself, I've been in the uh, pharma industry for the last 16 or 17 years, and before that, I was actually in academic research uh, focused on behavioral neuroscience. But during my time in the industry, I've really um, grown to get uh, grown and learn to uh, understand the, the plight of patients everywhere uh, through the connections that I've made through relationships um, that um, I've developed uh, over the course of my career. And it's really um, given me a passion for really doing things like this because I really uh, want to understand how I can help um, patients and, and uh, people best, um, especially in the world that I live in, which is uh, leveraging digital technologies. And so with that, uh, what I'd like to do is really start off by really having each of my panelists uh, introduce themselves uh, and tell us a little bit about the organizations that they work with as well. So uh, I'm gonna start with uh, maybe who I have on my screen. I'm not sure what the order is for everybody, uh, but maybe Krista, if you'd like to kick us off. Sure, thank you, Sven. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I'm actually not uh, related to uh, the, the healthcare industry at all. I'm a professor of computer science at uh, the University of California in Irvine. But, uh, you know, these advocacy groups have a special place in my heart, too. And um, so I've, I have worked before with a colleague in medicine who uh, was very much 
you know, involved with the local um, groups, uh, people with stroke in particular, recovering from stroke. And of course, um, you know, we all have friends who have gone through things like cancer and uh, other nasty diseases. And it's, um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great. Thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. If I can help in any way, I, I will be happy to. And I, I understand that, you know, with the COVID situation, um, it brings extra challenges to make people feel connected. And um, I have been working as a computer scientist uh, in, in, you know, platforms, online platforms that help connect people. And so if I can help in any way, I, I'll be very happy to. Great. Thank you, Thank you Krista. Um, Lorna, how about you next? Hi, I'm the CEO of the Lymphoma Coalition, which is a global network of patient organizations that help patients with lymphoma. And we have 83 members in 52 countries. And I have been working in um, the patient advocacy realm for over 30 years, which is a really long time, um, in different capacities. So I've worked at a national level, I've worked at a local level, and now I'm working globally. So lots of different experiences that have brought me to where we are today in, a, in an organization and a role that, that I really love. Where I do not have experience, I want to be really, really clear, is in hosting digital congresses. And where, when Dave asked if I would join this, he asked as somebody who is just like you, who is just trying to work their way through this process right now and understand how do we actually make this the most beneficial um, community spirited experience for, for our members moving forward. So hopefully what I am able to contribute to the conversation today is helpful. Great, thanks Lorna. Um, Nick, how about you next? Thanks, Gwen. So hi, everybody. I'm Nick Galarakis, uh, the Executive Director of the Stephen G. AYA Cancer Research Fund and co-founder of Elephants and Tea Magazine. Uh, and, you know, kind of two-sided things, but we're all one happy family. Uh, the Stephen G. AYA Cancer Research Fund and AYA, for those that aren't familiar in the cancer space, is adolescent and young adults. And we help uh, fund research and support patients and the community within the AYA space with wellness kits, education, uh, and, and different ways from a mindfulness standpoint. The Elephants and Tea side of things, we've been around for about a year and a half now. We are a media company slash magazine specifically for the adolescent young adult group, uh, focusing on storytelling, first person stories where patients and survivors have a space to come together and share their experiences on what they're going through on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we're a free magazine as a nonprofit across the country to individuals and also we're in 52 hospitals across the country supporting people from a psychosocial standpoint. So uh, that, that's what we do from the, the cancer side of things. And one of the other cool things about me joining today uh, when, when Dave and team uh, asked me to be a part of this is my previous background before diving into the advocacy side of things was digital media content marketing, specifically in virtual events. Uh, I helped run several large scale virtual events for um, massive companies uh, in the manufacturing space, agriculture space, tech space, uh, and, and coming up with new ideas and strategies around the digital media marketing side of things. So exactly what we're talking about today. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a little bit of a hybrid, uh, be a part of the advocacy world for the past year and a half, and then also bring in the digital media side of things for virtual events. So pumped to be here. Great. Thanks, Nick. Now, Dave, I know everybody's familiar with who you are because you kicked off the whole conversation to begin with, but maybe you can uh, just pro provide a bit more insight and uh, background, especially as it relates to the virtual conference. Thank you, Shwen. I'd be honored to. Uh, it's nice to turn around and sit on the panel for a moment. Uh, honored to be with you on this side as well. Um, so I'm one of four co-founders for Grit Health. Uh, we filed the original startup paperwork on February 4th of 2016, which is actually World Cancer Day. So our birthday is actually World Cancer Day. Um, and the insights that I'll be sharing today about our work in virtual conferences and other things, um, I feel like I'm just sharing what our team and our collaborations has learned. Um, and so with anything, including how complex virtual conferences are to pull off. Um, it takes a, a family and a, and a town in most cases to make all these things happen. So just honored to get to share what we've learned. Um, Grit Health also operates a global cancer community platform. Uh, so we encourage everybody to go online and Google Grit Health Cancer Community and check out more of our work. Um, and just thrilled to dive into this panel together. Great, thanks Dave. 
Now, I think, um, you know, at this point in time when most of us have been uh, in quarantine and uh, in, in this sort of situation where virtual meetings have become the norm, uh, all of us now have experience with, with what it's like actually uh, getting online and doing calls uh, via Zoom or any other kind of virtual platform. Um, and so before we sort of jump into the many aspects of virtual conferences and how they can be different or what needs to be done that's, um, you know, different from a traditional live in-person conference, uh, I'd love to steal, uh, I think, a question that was brought up by uh, Lorna previously, uh, which I think will actually help us set the context of everything, but at the same time allow for us to vent all the frustrations that we've been having over the last few weeks and months in this, uh, in this virtual world, which is what don't we like about virtual conferences? What are the things that actually uh, really get us when we're in this virtual world versus um, you know, the live conferences that we traditionally have? Um, and uh, Lorna, since you, I think you brought that question up, I'd love to turn it over to you first. Thank you. So yes, when we were trying to decide how are we going to take this global event that we do every year, usually face to face and turn it into something virtual. The first thing that my team did when we sat down and planning was like, what do we really hate about what we've been experiencing so far so that we don't replicate those issues when we try to take this, this global summit into a virtual reality. And so we had those discussions and it turns out there are a lot of things we don't like, right? So we don't like spending so much time on, on the screen. It's tiring, it's exhausting. You can't read your, your, uh, the, the person you're speaking to. You can't necessarily see them. You don't see their body language. It's a little bit harder for a brain to process how we're addressing our audience. Um, group discussions can be tricky. If the technology is either not working well or people don't understand what button to press, who speaks next? Do you raise a hand? Do you not raise a hand? Does the, is the person who's facilitating the meeting, do they see that or not? How do we make sure everybody gets heard in a meeting? Um, does everyone speaking have the right technology? If you, you're working with a bad microphone or a bad uh, webcam, can we really see you? Can we hear you? Uh, internet drops in and out sometimes for people. When uh, people are switching presentations back and forth, does the person who's now presenting, do they press the right buttons and we see what we're supposed to? Sometimes we see their email pop up. Lots of different things are happening um, that are really distracting and don't allow you to focus in on the meeting that we're trying to have. So those all came into play for us when we were trying to figure out what do we want to avoid so that we can ensure that the time we do spend on screen with our members are really the most worthwhile and productive for everybody. Great, thank you. Um, anybody else from the panel would like to add? I, I'll say actually um, for the panel, anytime you wanna chime in, uh, and this is a virtual conference thing, feel free to raise your hand so I can see it and then uh, I'll, I'll come to you. But anybody else would like to add into that? I know personally for me, um, I joined BMS only about seven weeks ago, and certainly the transition to a uh, to a new company in a completely virtual world uh, was certainly something that was very different for me, where I don't get to meet any of my colleagues in real life or step into an office for that matter. Um, so that experience too is similar to, I think, live meetings. I attend a lot of live conference and speak at a few, attend a few, and that uh, hallway conversation, the serendipity of meeting people, um, all those are lost in this environment. And I think those are things that I really miss from a live uh, uh, meeting, um, especially when some of those meetings I, I've gone to for a long time, I consider reunions with old friends. And, and that's really hard to do sometimes to get that feeling when we're on a virtual world. And, and Schwen, if I can just echo to that too, it's the, the small little personable things, right? That we pick up from each other. Uh, when you were just mentioning that comment, I was just thinking I used to work in an office and say, hey, let's go get a coffee break real quick just to break away from the day-to-day the -day type stuff uh, and to just learn about that person on a personal level versus the working level, I think is, is very important too. And the same thing goes when you're at an event, right? When you're going back and forth from one session to the next or one booth to the other, you pick up on little things with people that you definitely miss out from a virtual standpoint. Great. Yeah, I mean, so it, it, one, one thing that I, I think um, 
you know, there's a distinction between the platforms that we have right now, like Zoom, for example, and the, the that uh, in a way um, inform our impression of what virtual meetings are. And then there's uh, things that we can imagine that could be different and um, that that can be designed in the future. And uh, I think that's certainly the thing, the technology that we have now, um, it's not prepared for virtual meetings, that is for sure. It's not, it's prepared for video conferencing, for things that you have an objective and uh, you talk to that objective, it's actually very efficient. I think that virtual meetings that when you have an objective and you meet for half an hour and you just uh, get to the point and it's super effective, even more than face to face. But uh, for everything else, you know, when the, when the function itself requires serendipity and uh, different ad hoc people getting together, uh, that is not being supported at all by the by these platforms. And so that is, I think, what's really really missing. Lorna, you raise your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to add as well, for us, you're right, our, our global summit is a family reunion. We think of it that way. And we're huggers, right? Um, that's what happens in our world. We, we, we hug, we, we kiss cheeks, we do all those things. And for us, it's really important to consider as we move into this, how do we still maintain some of that um, some way through a virtual experience so that we don't lose that closeness and, and that family kind of relationships that we have built so far. Because it's really important to how we just function as a group overall. Great. Dave, I saw you raise your hands. I'm, I'm assuming that was the, the big sort of uh, high 10 for uh, hugging. That, that was enthusiastic support for <laughs> hugging, that's all. <laughs> Great. Now, you know, uh, along those lines, I think one of the key sort of themes uh, that we've been just talking about is just the whole idea of engagement. And um, it's very different when you're in person and you can pick up on emotions and you walk around and you can have eye contact with individuals on stage. Um, how does that differ in this virtual world? What are some of the best practices for really keeping an audience engaged in a virtual world? I mean, it's, it's okay if you have one or two people online, but what happens when you have a group of, you know, 80, 90, 100 people online? How, what, what are some of the things we can do to really make sure that the engagement factor is there? So I'll jump in first on that one. I think it's having sessions that are set up like this, right? Where you have a panel that is gonna interact with people that are attending and allowing them to ask questions and be a part of things. Um, when you get into the type of setups that are just a straight lecture, for you know, five hours straight from one lecture to the next and not having much interaction, that hurts. That hurts not just from, a, um, from an attendee standpoint, but it also hurts if you have supporters and sponsors as well, because they want to be able to interact with people and keep them engaged. So being able to have um, chat functionalities with a, a booth, if you have some sort of exhibit hall, right, when you're setting up an event or a Congress uh, and having those types of things, as well as I'll uh, take it a step further, some sort of gamification and incentivizing people to go from booth to booth, just like you would at, a, at an in-person event, uh, trying to get people to interact and, and check out what's out there, what are the cool uh, activities going on. So just to get people to go in and out of different areas as well. So, you know, I, 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 I've been working on some of these platforms for a long time. I've, I've, I've been um, part of a group that has developed a, a virtual environment for, a 3D with avatars and uh, you know a whole entire conference center and stuff uh, in the world. It's it's actually pretty cool. Uh, I I I love it and uh, I could show some you know I could show share the screen here the show. But but one thing that that is pretty clear is that uh, after you know I've been working on this for many years uh, about 10 12 years. Uh, but it's very clear to me that. Uh, um, you know, there's more going on when you when you organize a conference in a virtual environment. There is the platform itself, and then there is the event, and the event is something that is that transcends the the concrete platform. And so, you know, 3D avatars and the metaphor of a of a virtual space is very it, it's very cool, and it definitely works for a lot of people that really like that kind of stuff. But it's actually not necessary. <laughs> That's sort of the, the conclusion that I that I uh, that I arrived after so many years of using it. I still love it. I, it's it's still my thing, but it's actually not necessary. What's really necessary, I think, that, that and that's where the event really transcends the platform is the the 
the exposing people, exposing people's presence and exposing people's engagement both with each other and with the content and with the, the speakers on stage. So those cues of pre people presence, that is what really makes it work. Now, if you work in a virtual environment and uh, you know, 3D and avatars, that's relatively easy because uh, you, you, know, you just have, you have this avatar. So you kind of see sort of, you know, oh, there's, you know, there's these three avatars over here and then there's three avatars over there and stuff. But, but it's, it's actually, you, you don't actually need that in order to be able to expose uh, the the presence of people. So you can do the same thing in in uh, simpler modes that that are going to be more accessible to a lot of people. And so that's that's the next thing that we are working right now, especially in this emergency, because we have also a lot of conferences uh, in in academic, you know, in, in universities that are now kind of figuring out what to do. So we're very rapidly uh, making something that's a lot simpler, a simpler modality, not 3D avatars, but uh, but that also that basically tries to emulate the same thing, exposing the presence of people and the, the presence of different groups of people interacting. Dave, okay. go ahead. Yeah, so um, uh, I will uh, admit something I've probably not admitted before. Uh, in, in physical conferences, uh, I almost always need to step away and find a quiet place to go recharge. You know, just that intensity of things on is is really, uh, compressive. And I was a researcher in my life before this work with grit, and I could be intellectually on and push through that. But everybody on the, the chat here, you know, we do work that we are so personally and emotionally invested in, that that's something that I don't have the connection with those people like Krista was just talking about, you know, hugging neck or, you know, smiling at Lorna or all of these things like put back in me that energy. And that's, you know, it's, it's a real shift having left all the meetings we were planning to and now coming together like this without just being able to hug. Yeah, Nick, go ahead, please. Uh, just to, to add to what Krista was saying too, if, as far as the cool avatars and things like that, when it comes to a virtual standpoint, how content really does drive it. The other side of this too, in setting up an event, getting more fancy with avatars with 3D, can sometimes bring more potential issues as well. So I agree, it, it's, it's so cool to have if it's done right, but at the end of the day, if the content's not right and the event's not set up, it, it really, I don't wanna say it doesn't matter, but it doesn't, it, it, it can take away from what's actually trying to be um, shared, which is the content and the engagement experiences that people are developing for the audience, right? Uh, and back to what Dave said, I, I agree that, you know, for those in the, in the advocacy space, regardless if it's cancer or whatever it may be, we're very passionate. And I'll, I will agree with you, Dave. I haven't admitted that out loud. We all need to find our quiet space every now and then just to kind of go hide for a bit and then come back or get a workout in and come back, right? So anyways, fun fact. Yeah, and actually, you know, speaking about workouts, that's the other advantage of a live meeting, isn't it? You actually do get a bit of exercise in as you're going from one lecture hall to another and so on. So uh, versus the complete opposite, which is a staying in the seat and really just being sedentary the whole time. Uh, but it's funny, as I hear Krista and Nick, uh, you guys talking about virtual worlds, I'm reminded of um, when I was a little younger, uh, which is aging myself now, uh, and I used to be part of this thing called Second Life, uh, if you guys remember that. Uh, but I never had to attend any lectures on it or, or meetings, so it was a very different participation medium. Um, but speaking of content, I'd love to jump into materials. And I think we're very used to preparing materials, whether they are handouts for the lecture audience, poster boards for um, you know, the, the actual walkthroughs, and then um, presentation materials for slides um, for, for live meetings. How do those need to change? Are they just adapt very simply adaptable to a virtual medium or do we actually need to rethink this completely? So in, I, if I jump, I think that in a way, virtual meetings make that aspect easier. Um, if you plan ahead and if you, if you have a good plan for how to deliver those documents. So it's, it makes it easier because you can just write up web pages that have all the links to everything. And, uh, you know, as long as those web pages are have a good navigation for people will find them. Right. So in a way it's easier. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, it's not as easy as you may think, and it requires some planning. 
that's sort of one of the surprises, I think, that people who are used to organizing physical events, uh, they, they may think that, you know, moving it online is just, is, you know, it's just set up, you just put up a web page about the event and you just set up a Zoom meeting and that's it. <laughs> and that's not it at all. Actually, there's a whole other uh, part of organizing and making sure that people know how to find the information in this other way. Uh, and so, so there's a lot of planning that you kind of have to rethink of how the things that you did in the physical space, how do you do them now in this media? But, but it can be easier. It can, once you have done that work, it can be easier, certain things. Okay. Nick? So I'll say it can be easier. However, there are definitely situations where um, you have, so I think where I'm going with this is when you have something like with COVID right now, where you had that in-person event, you had promised certain things to sponsors or other people when it comes to having X amount of signage, right? And, and for those that, that can see Dave's uh, uh, video right now, he has the, an example of a virtual hall behind him, right, of the actual uh, exchange advocacy I'm probably saying that wrong, Dave, of exactly what the event is behind you, but uh, it, you'll find that um, virtual event halls, the simpler is better, especially when it comes from a navigation standpoint, what Krista was saying, where to be able to drive people to a certain direction. With that said, though, you may have already promised a lot more things to people, so you have to try to get creative to find ways to, to make sure that people are getting the exposure that they want. So I think that it it's I'm kind of contradicting myself here. I recognize that, but it, it's it's tricky. It depending if it's if it started as a virtual event, it's definitely easier to come up with the signage and everything else. If it's taking an in-person event and then now having to go virtual because of everything that's going on with COVID right now, it, it can get it can get hairy, and you almost have to just have a sit down with your client or sponsor or supporter and say, "Hey, this is what we're limited to. How can we make it work and figure things out from there." Um, so there's, there's like two sides. So one is that conversation and having the understanding with the supporter. The other side of it is actually just the functionality of it. So what Chris is saying, it should be easier. It absolutely can be very simple, but you still have to please those people and make sure that, that people are getting what they, what they think they're going to get. Yeah. I, I have one that I'll add on that too. I think I forget, uh, it might've been Krista in our prep session um, said that this is really a rethinking experience. This is not taking physical and making it digital. Digital. This requires rethinking the experience. And Nick, I love that you said it's as much about what the audience wants and then how you maintain the relationship after as it is just about the content. Um, and, you know, in any field that's newer or more people are being forced into it, there's learning and then teaching. And, you know, I, I, so, the, so we, we learn first, right? And then now try to help other organizations. And I wish that I had been able to articulate sooner all of the things that can take up huge amount of times that don't necessarily translate to things in a virtual environment, that if you're sitting in a physical environment with documents and papers and you know walls and signage and all that kind of stuff, um, if I can give any advice to somebody who's just at the process, start of the process, it's to really think about how this will be a different experience and what we can plan to make that better versus taking things and trying to squeeze them in. It's round peg, square hole kind of situation. Great. Lorna, you had something to say. When we started looking at this process, one of the things we did, of course, we had a whole conference set up already, and we have all these interesting topics and a lot of different discussion groups planned. And so for us, even, it was going into that very basic of looking at those, those things that we thought were important when we set the original agenda and saying, are these actually still going to work in a digital space? Are they still going to work in the current environment that we're focusing in? Is there anything that we're missing? And so uh, one of the things we've done recently is go back and survey our members in a quick little survey monkey exercise, just seeing what has been the effect of COVID on their organizations. Are there priorities that we knew about uh, pre-COVID the same post-COVID? And do we have to make adjustments to the agenda items and, and what are the priorities for, for us to work through together as a group? And even into um, how we then look where we know we need to still have discussions and build upon best practices from people. How are we going to incorporate that? Is some of that through document sharing and making notes on documents rather than trying to do everything through virtual discussions, which we've already discussed can be really tricky based on, on people's technology expertise and also the number of people participating. 
So it really is, like you said, a rethink exercise. Like how do we get to these same end results perhaps, but in very different mechanisms? And uh, you have to be very open to thinking in new ways, but also open to the change that comes with that and the learning that's needed. Like I said, for us, this is a, a big learning exercise and that's okay. Uh, we're adapting as we go, and, but we're also listening a lot to experts. We're calling lots of people and saying, how did you do this? How did this work? Tell me not only what worked for you, but what hasn't worked and explain to me why so we can we can act, think about this a little bit differently for how it will work with our experience. Great, thank you. Um, you know, we talked a lot about this, uh, about tactics already, but th there was a question from the audience on what other tactic can we use to really enhance and improve a virtual conference? Um, and, and one of the things I was going to ask next that sort of falls into this category is how about even just presentation slides? So we're used to using slides and then we're still engaging the audience as a person on stage when you give presentations. Uh, one of the things I like to use is animation, uh, like animated GIFs or videos. Um, those don't translate quite as well in a virtual world, especially when bandwidth sometimes doesn't work to our advantage. Um, what is, you know, what are some of the best uh, practices or tips around those types of presentations and uh, what other tactics can you think of that would help enhance a virtual um, meeting? Sure, absolutely. So first of all, I would highly recommend people not just reading off a slide. Uh, if you think it's painful at an in-person event, it's really painful virtually, I think, too. So just to, you know, I want to call that out right away. And I, we've all been guilty of it at one point or another. I know I have. Um, but you're right, as far as the animations and the GIFs, they, I still think that those can be effective, but you always run that risk of, of having bandwidth issues, right? And we talked about this a little bit on our pre-call of live versus recorded, the benefits of one versus the other. Um, and I, I think that there's, there's good with both. So just to touch on that, one, I think live is always going to engage people more. And when people know that it's live, like this session here, for example, We'll have more people logging in, checking it out, uh, having an actual start time. Uh, when you pre-record it, however, you're guaranteed, I shouldn't say guaranteed, but most likely you're gonna have less issues from a presentation standpoint because you can edit it beforehand, um, but you still have potential issues. Oh, things are flying here, sorry about that. Um, see, live, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, but um, my, I think it's my phone. Anyways, total link. See, live. This, if it was pre-recorded, we could have edited this part out where I just totally <laughs> lost my train of thought with my phone falling off the table. But no, seriously, um, having interactions still, if you're able to ask questions to people, say, hey, type them into the chat, those are going to engage people in having conversations versus just having 25 slides that you're just going to read off and present in a lecture format. I recognize that some uh, some presentations, you have to have that type of setup. And I think people expect that going into it. But the more you can find ways to have people ask questions throughout the presentation, the better. Um, I still like having some kind of animation or videos beforehand. Test, test, test. Don't just launch a, a video or animated GIF without practicing it, practicing it beforehand. You're, I, I'm willing to bet it's just something's going to go wrong. It's not going to work, whatever the case may be. As far as bandwidth issues, um, making sure that the video is not too big. And get it as low as you can where it's not going to be pixelated. Uh, you're always going to have issues with some, someone's bandwidth. Someone's always going to have a problem. It's just one of those unfortunate things virtually that you just can't control. Um, and and as, as painful as that is, I know for those that work in in-person events are all control freaks to a certain extent. I can be one of them, so I can say that but that's just one thing you can't control. So being able to have images, uh, speaking to images instead of words is always better. Um, I'm, I'm still okay with videos and animated GIFs if they're not huge from a resolution standpoint. And again, getting people to engage with conversation and having them ask questions throughout. Those are those are the key factors there. Dave, and then Krista after. Yeah, I was actually going to give Krista a compliment, so I hope I'm not stealing your, your point, Krista. Um, uh, being able to articulate, the question was, you know, what are the specific things we can do to enhance the experience? And, you know, being able to understand new things in tangible ways is really important. And Krista, I think you said in one of our conversations, creating an agenda that follows the sun 
can help more people stay involved, right? And, you know, if this is a global conference, I see on the side, we have people from Ireland and, you know, different areas. Our first one of these sessions, we scheduled at 3 p.m. Eastern, and we were really pushing, you know, part of Europe late into the evening. And so we had to ask people to stay on much later in their days. And so it may seem like this time was scheduled because it's lunchtime if you're in an Eastern time zone, but we've actually adjusted this time to allow more of our European colleagues to be able to connect and also those on the West Coast in the States to be able to join in earlier in the day. So Krista, I thought that was a beautiful you know, way to describe something that is um, sort of abstract, but just follow the sun with your schedule. It's a very simple concept. And in fact, you know, so time zones are a big problem when you're organizing virtual events, especially if you have you're expecting attendees from all over the world. You can't just fly them all to one place, so they're all, you know, and you cannot fight uh, the, the the cycles that people have. They're sleepy at night, and uh, they will go to sleep. Uh, so one one thing that we are that we have that we are going to do that we are doing in one of the conferences that I'm helping organize is that there's basically we came to realize that there's I can tell you already I th I don't think this is debatable this is this is what it is there's basically three time bands that you can organize your events one is centered in the Atlantic Ocean the Atlantic Ocean you can get the Americans and the Europeans Middle Easterns and Africans that time band, we call it the Atlantic time band. For two or three hours, you can do that, okay? Uh, the next one is the Pacific time band. In the Pacific time band, you can get the Americans and you can get the Asians and the Australians and New Zealanders. That, that's again, two or three hours in the day that you can have those uh, two continents, uh, uh, three, got us, Oceania is one. Um, and the next one is the Indian, Ocean. The Indian Ocean, you get Europeans, Middle Eastern, Africans, and uh, Asia, all the way to Asia, you know, uh, um, and so the, you, again, two or three hours in there. So you can basically organize your event in these in this time bands. And then if you want to do a little extra kick, there's one hour in, in the day where you can potentially uh, gather almost everybody except unfortunately the New Zealanders. <laughs> but that one hour is at 6.30 a.m. in California, uh, which is like, you know, 10.30 or 11.30 in, uh, in, in parts like in China and Korea and Australia, in Australia. So it, it's still, you know, people can are still awake they haven't they can stay awake yet for an hour, another hour and it's 6 at 6 30 a.m a lot of people in california are already awake so there's like one hour there that if you want to maximize the number of, of uh, simultaneous people that's the only hour that you have and that's it so if you if you really want to kind of have uh, you know follow the sun or catch capture people when they are awake uh, these are these are your options uh, these, these time bands are centered on the major oceans of the earth and and then this one hour uh, that that you can find most people so that is a little tidbit for those of you who are organizing global events just have this in mind great thank you um, you know our conversation on engagement has just seamlessly bled right into talking about logistics and to an extent platforms and technology as well so uh, on that note, um, I would love to understand also because, you know, in, in, again, in a real life meeting, speaker preparation is something that's pretty easy to do. You gather all of them in, in a green room and you start talking to them, you know, a little bit in advance and you sometimes have rehearsals. But how is that different in a virtual world? Um, how, how do you prepare speakers to actually present in a virtual world? Anyone? So I, I think you, you, I mean, the having training sessions is absolutely important, you know, bringing people in <laughs> before they go live and give them just, you know, this is the platform we're going to use. Here's how you click the buttons and here's what you should and should not do. And it can be very quick. It doesn't need to take a long time, but it's, I think it's important. Agreed. And I think also too, if, if the, the biggest factor I've seen is if people ever need to share their screen with slides, depending on the platforms, like Zoom, for example, you're able to share your screen, you're not gonna load up slides into a system. Uh, that has been, I think, the biggest hurdle when I've worked with different clients in the past of making sure the speakers know that either A, the slides are gonna be loaded up into a system, or B, they're gonna be sharing their screen and either one just showing them how to functionally use it. Just like Krista said, having a practice session or two 
that usually that usually solves the problem. But definitely have a practice session. Don't go blind into it. Lorna? And also some really practical things, right? Like just um, what should they wear? What shows up well on camera? What doesn't? What should your background be? What what is a what is problematic if you're going to use um, one of the screens that come with Zoom, right? So you have you use one of the Zoom backgrounds. Does it actually work for you? Sometimes people are really active when they speak, and then you'll see that their their um, their own room starts to show through the Zoom background, and that's really distracting. So it's even some very practical things to help people so that, that they come across in a way that people can focus on what they're saying rather than, than, than what's sitting behind them. It, it's very different working this way, right? I mean, even from my, my team perspective, when we have our, our staff meetings once a week and everybody is sitting in their own house or in their own backyard or whatever it might be, and we're all like, oh, what kind of flowers did you plant there? Or, hey, what's your cat doing right now? So those things are going to happen. And also to let people know that's okay. Sometimes cats jump in front of screens, no matter how much you prepare for it. Sometimes your six-year-old is gonna wander into the room and ask you an inappropriate question. That's just the way it is. We're getting used to that kind of thing. Don't freak out too much if that kind of stuff happens. Keep going and let's focus on the conversation at hand. We forgive you those small things. Like it just happens now and uh, we're okay. We'll make it through. Yeah, I have to say if there's been any silver lining to this situation, I think the globe now is fully much more empathetic about uh, the virtual environment and it's brought out some humanity to anybody that's on a conference now because of those situations when your child runs into the room or your pet starts barking in the background. Um, it, it shows that you're real as a speaker as well, right? You're not just that corporate overlord that's telling people what to do. Uh, you're, you're, you're actually just like them. You've got the same issues. And I say for all the you know, issues that we do have with virtual conference, as one of the big advantages that I, I feel um, uh, we get from this platform is also, I can actually read the chat that's going on right now and see some of the questions coming out. That to me has been really helpful because it also helps guide some of the questions that I, um, uh, I want to ask you and, and see where the priority should be rather than just have a set um, of questions that I know I want to get through. Uh, so I will say that's actually been very um, helpful as well. And, and um, to, to go along with that, I'd love to get, oh, sorry, Krista, you had something to say. Yeah, I just a time, you know, one thing that is clearly different from physical conference is that, you know, in a physical setting, if somebody's speaking on stage, or I mean, it, it is very rude if you interrupt them, right? If you just keep talking or whatever, it's, it's super rude. In here, actually, it's it's really nice when people are chatting on the text as we are speaking. It's actually really nice. So don't think that it's rude. It's the opposite of rude. That it's it's really like we, we it, it's super important for the speakers on stage to see what people are you know how people are reacting and stuff. That is really it gives it gives more energy to the whole environment. So it's not rude at all. And I, I love this aspect of actual social interaction while we're talking about certain topics that that um, you know suddenly remind people of a question that they had and suddenly the group and the community starting to answer some of those as you're talking about it as well. Um, so some of the things I think I saw earlier on were really about the platform itself. And I think maybe one of the questions that people have is, how do you select what platform is right for you? And obviously there's some groups that only have meetings that are 10 people or less and others that are thinking about hundreds and thousands of people that want to join in. What is the best practice or, or what are some of the guidelines for actually selecting the right platform for your virtual conference? Well, I can, I can start this off if you guys want. So the, something that we talked about uh, in our pre-call for this, that in, in the past different vendors that I've worked with and trying to set up different uh, events on who we're gonna work with with these and partner with these, I have found personally that a lot of the different vendors and platforms that are out there are very similar when it comes to the front end of things, as far as the type of imaging that you can have. Uh, the, the, that is something that usually you can even just create your own image and load it in as a lobby, right? And just hyperlink different areas. The biggest things for me are, um, one, how smooth it is for a user to get in and out, registration wise, and two, reporting after the fact. I think that it's crucial for the organization. And I think this is more so for like what Lorna has with the huge Congress potentially, to be able for those events with larger numbers, you have to have the reporting down sound. 
and to be able to access who did what, when, and where immediately afterwards to engage with people afterwards. Uh, same thing goes for your supporters, those that have booths, those that have different downloads that they wanna be able to track what people are clicking on and what content they're interacting with so people know what people wanna engage with after the fact as well. Those are my biggest things. We can definitely get more into like the certain designs and things like that. But I think the biggest takeaway is the reporting side and how easy and smooth it is for people to get in as well. So uh, from the, the, the technical perspective, which is what I'm expert at, uh, I think there is a big factor here is the size of the event. Um, and the, the, your, your options are very considerably um, depending on whether you are organizing something that is 20 people or 200 people or 2000 people, especially the larger events, you really have to up your production basically because um, it, many of these platforms simply don't work very well if you have a lot of people. And so, but on the other hand, you know, if you are organizing a physical conference and it's a large physical conference, you have to invest a lot in things like AV and, uh, you know, the venue and stuff like that. It's very expensive. So you need to start thinking like that also for large virtual conferences. You need to think that it's going to cost uh, some considerable amount of money to set up a production that can handle, you know, 2,000 people or, or, or more. And so you, you, when you go up to those numbers, um, yes, Zoom can perhaps, you know, if you talk to them, can hold a webinar with 3,000 people, but do you really want to put all your eggs in the, in the Zoom basket? You know, what happens when the West Coast people wake up and all the Zoom servers go uh, haywire and stuff? So uh, there are other technology, you know, you have to start thinking about alternatives, like, for example, live casting. So live casting is something that is super scalable. Uh, it's uh, you can just live cast to YouTube or Twitch or something like that. It, they are prepared for those crowds. Uh, that's what they do. Uh, that's their business. And uh, and so it's it's perhaps a better option when you go into large numbers is to think about how to live cast a smaller event that then that that one can happen on Zoom something like this, but then everybody will will uh, watch the the live casts in, in you know some some other interface and so the, so the 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 size of the event is definitely something that has a huge impact on on your options and i could go to a lot more <laughs> on this but I'll, I'll i'll shut up for now okay yeah um we we've learned and we're still learning every event to i guess try to look at three things so the first is who are the stakeholders? And I don't just mean the audience. I mean, who are the stakeholders? You know, if there are sponsors or speakers or researchers, how will they interact? And that's the second piece is how does everybody interact and what do you want that to be like? And then the third piece is what is the goal or the experience you're striving for? You know, and I think if we're just presenting or disseminating knowledge in one direction, um, Zoom and a lot of those delivery mechanisms work good, well, but if you're trying to bring people together to share, you know, emerging scientific knowledge with a vulnerable patient population, that's a really exquisitely sensitive balance. And the more we think about, you know, who's involved and what do we need to be able to do, and then what do we want that to achieve? And I loved the person who asked, you know, what is a practical example? When we did a large conference the end of last year, the Global Virtual Cancer Conference, um, all of the live sessions were on one day, but then we had people coming back to view 500 pages of content a day after that. And so even though there was really good live engagement, the platform that we were using and the functionality with exhibitor booths allowed a whole wave of people to come back or to visit that couldn't be there live. So, you know, thinking about all those aspects are really, really important. Great. Lorna. Just to expand a little bit on what uh, Dave was just saying, for us, our, our our summit is usually really interactive. So when we are right now, we're in the process of going through um, meetings with different vendors to see who can accommodate how this might work in a virtual reality. And uh, um, one thing is not everybody is not everybody's platform is built to do that, right? So when when Chris is talking about following the sun, for us, we're working with 12 different time zones across our member organizations, and we have this all mapped out as to who is awake when and how then we could break them down into smaller groups so they could engage. 
And for us, that means that we will probably do a Congress over a period of time rather than just in one or two days like that we would normally do to accommodate this. But then you're getting a platform ready that is willing to provide you that service over time when a lot of them are very much based on a one or two day experience. And so it's a different pricing option, definitely. Um, don't think necessarily that going virtual is cheaper than uh, your face-to-face. -face. It's not, it can get expensive very quickly. Um, and if we're going to allow that ability though, which is really important to us, then we need to invest there because this is a priority function for us. So going back and figuring out what is the most important thing for you about what your, your meeting or Congress is, what are the goals? What are the aims? What are you trying to achieve at the end of the day? And just one point about the uh, platform itself. Uh, we're testing platforms by using our most technically in a debt staff person, the person who is the most challenged all the time, regardless of what we're doing. And that's the person we're trying to get to work through this to see if um, the issues that they're facing, if somehow we can um, ease that when we actually go live with, with our members or prepare them in some extra training up front to remove any issues. So just, just something to keep in mind. I won't name names who that person is. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, I realize we only have about four more minutes till the top of the hour. That went by really quick. Uh, but I also see a few people had to drop off probably because of timing. So I'd like to remind everybody on the line that um, even though I unfortunately have to drop off at the top of the hour due to some prior commitments, Dave will be sort of taking over. It's going to be the Dave takeover uh, of this panel and he's going to continue this discussion. Uh, but um, before I have to leave, I thought maybe what would be uh, really uh, great is if each of you could maybe think of uh, one secret tip that you have for, uh, you know, doing well in a virtual world. And, and uh, if you can't think of that, then maybe one simple metric that you think is definitely an important measure in a virtual world. I'll jump first because I had an immediate thought. <laughs> um, uh, I, my advice is the more expert you are in a physical environment, the harder it can be to let go of those skills to learn what excellence is in virtual. And so um, if I can uh, encourage people to really open up to questions and Lorna, you do so beautifully, you know, asking people who aren't expert and really trying to understand their experience, you know, not not holding on to the expertise in physical, but really allowing what is virtual all about and how do we do that? Great. Marna. I would just encourage if this is something you're thinking you need to do, then you need to plan ahead. Everybody, all the companies are really busy right now, really busy. Some of the vendors we're speaking to are requiring three months um, notice from the same time you sign the contract to when your event is actually live so they will have enough time to plan and get it up and running effectively for you so you really do need to plan ahead and you need a backup plan so um, just figuring that through in your head so if your your speakers internet does go down what are you doing if the facilitator is having an issue getting onto your platform what are you doing and really it is like a very different kind of planning to what you might be doing in in a um, face to face meeting but some of those principles are still exactly the same so make sure you are make you have all of those kinds of ducks in your row whatever it might be even if your backup plan is just telling people this is not working we're going to redo it tomorrow at least you know what your your reaction is going to be if something does happen Mister. so uh <clears throat> i <clears throat> agree with everything that my fellow fellow panelists have said I, I want to add something uh, slightly different if just a little bit fun so there's all sorts of problems that you have to deal with and plan ahead and stuff let me just add something that i think adds a little bit of humanity and i think will it will enhance your uh virtual event by a tenfold which is consider bringing live music <laughs> there are 
artists all over the world. Now you don't have to bring them, you know, fly them around or whatever. There's lots of good people everywhere. And they're actually going through a bad phase, a bad period, because they cannot perform live in the, you know, the bars or whatever. And, you know, just having people, there's actually lots of music, amateur musicians who are totally ready to stream on Twitch, for example. And uh, just consider, you know, you probably would also have an entertainment program in the physical conference, many conferences do, you know, maybe just consider doing it also here. Nick. So the benefits and the, the downside of going last, I have all these thoughts in my head now, but I'll try to just keep it quick. Um, simpler sometimes is better for everybody. Lorna touched on it. Make sure you have day of support with wherever you have, because things will, will happen. And, and I'm going to take a little different approach with my last little secret for people follow up with people the day after. Don't wait to follow up with people while it's fresh in their minds, follow up immediately. Great, thank you very much. And um, you know, I'm sorry I have to drop off, but thank you very much to my esteemed panelists. I'll do something that I don't know I've ever done before in a virtual meeting, which is if, uh, because we can't say a round of applause to a virtual conference. Um, if you would like to give a virtual applause, can I just ask you to add the word clap to the uh, chat, please, just to give the uh, <laughs> panelists a, a round of applause uh, in, in a very different manner. Oh, look at that. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed this, and I hope you did too. I hope you took away some uh, learnings. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Dave now. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I hope to see you again soon. Sure, thank you so much. And what a wonderful way to end that bringing together. I love it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, so for everybody that's able to stay on now, we've got a little more time to dive in a little deeper. Um, and Chris, I know you've got some things if you'd like to share some of the work that you're doing. Um, and I think we can take this conversation down another layer into some of the details and the practicalities. So Krista, would you like to start with some of the things you've been developing in your area of expertise? Sure. Is it okay if I share my screen? Can I share my screen here? Please, that'd be great. Okay, it's, it's just for fun. I didn't actually plan this, but uh, you know, okay. uh, we're we're live, so uh, let me sh show you the um, the virtual environment. If it, actually, somebody mentioned Second Life, so this is the Second Life environment. It's the Second Life client. For those of you who remember, it it uh, it does not run on Second Life. It runs on my own server. So this was an open source project that I started collaborating a few years back. It's called Open Simulator, and uh, and so it has the same kind of uh, experiences as, as Second Life. It has you know the avatars. Here's me sitting down. I'm actually always logged in here on my virtual app. Uh, you have a whole, you know, meeting room with panels and live TVs and there's, the, it's night right now, so I'm sorry you don't see it very well. There's the, the convention center over there, so the, this, I'm in a virtual island, as you can see, tropical island, although it's kind of night right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's the convention center with poster sessions and there's the auditorium, the main auditorium over here with the, the, the you know, the, the stage over there. So this is a lot of fun and uh, organizing, we actually, the Open Simulator conf, uh, community, which is a, you know, considerable amount of people all over the world using Open Simulator, but very much sort of in, in the kind of virtual worlds. Um, so we all we always have an annual conference uh, in December uh, with the whole community it brings about five to six hundred people every year uh, to this virtual environment, uh, and it is a lot of fun. But you have to be an aficionado of these environments. You know, for people who are who just hate avatars, they hate to see themselves represented as avatars. This is a very unpleasant experience. Plus, you have you know. The, navigating in a 3D world is not as easy as you might want it to be. You think that it's easy. It's actually not easy at all. In, in, in you, you, first of all, you, it's, it's, there's a, these two things that you can walk around, you can make your avatar move, but also you can not walk around and you can uh, just move the camera. You know, there's the concept of a camera. That's what I'm doing right now. My avatar is sitting there and just moving my camera. It's much more convenient, but, uh, uh, but this requires some expertise uh, and, and uh, manipulating the mouse and the keyboard at the same time and you know 
this is definitely not uh, disability friendly at all. Uh, and so, and it's not people friendly at all. I, I understand that you know, lots of people just very feel very lost when they come into ve this very, very rich virtual environment. It's like, what do I even do, right? It's like, what's going on in here, right? So th that is, that is, uh, you know, I love this. I'm always logged in on a virtual app, but I, I understand that this is probably uh, not the best way of organizing uh, virtual conferences for large numbers of people that are highly accessible. So um, one, one other thing that we are doing right now very, very rapidly, and I can show you, let me stop the screen over here, uh, but I can show you uh, a, a, a very rapid uh, sort of uh, demo of um, uh, something that we are developing for a conference, which is not 3D at all, um, but uh, is um, it brings some of these elements and some of these lessons that I've learned uh, from organizing, uh, you know, conferences in 3D, which is what I was talking about, the, the presence of people and the richness. So this is something that's just a website, basically, but you can see immediately, you know, these are the three tracks, three parallel tracks that are going on at the same time, which happen just to be YouTube videos right now. But you see them all playing immediately when you come here, you see how, how many people are watching and you, you know, there's nobody watching that right now because this is running right here on my computer, we're still developing it. But but you can, you know, you can zoom in and watch and now, you know, there's a, how many people, I have two tabs over here, so there's two people watching, there's a question immediately there, uh, you know, there's, there's the presence of people that's sort of what I, I am going after here. And, uh, and there will be, there is also a lobby uh, part where you can uh, create your own video rooms and, uh, you know, uh, you know, cancer or something, uh, treatments, and anybody can do this and you can, uh, you can then join the, the treatments. I, you know, my, my server is probably not working right now. I should have prepared live. <laughs> Uh, so uh, these are things that happen when you do uh, things live, but basically this is this is sort of the kind of engagement that uh, I think is uh, I think people in some you know some platforms are already trying to do this and, and, and we, we're just designing it for academic conferences and probably you know we, we will be able to, to use this for other non-academic conferences and uh, probably for some of you who, who are interested will be happy to kind of them. It's an open source project. Uh, there is no commercial entity right now, so it's very, very early. But uh, but uh, what we really want to to experiment with is on these other things and all these liveness, right? The things that happen instantly. What are people looking? What are people paying attention to right now? Where are they? Who's talking to who? Right? All those cues, all that awareness that we have when we go into a physical. Uh, building uh, that's sort of what we're trying to emulate here not in 3d because i don't think it's necessary but in in uh in the simpler modality that's going to be a lot of, you know more available for a lot of other people so th this is what i i wanted to share and uh and uh, that that's what i'm we're working right now yeah it's wonderful to see that and what i'm paying attention to right now is whether i want to be scuba diving or dancing and i think scuba diving was winning out in the picture so uh, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful to see that thank you so much um lorna if i may ask you a follow-up question um with um let, let's just take a conference with exhibitors and if you've got 20 exhibitors who each have a booth and each booth has 10 pieces of content and you know you can quickly see how you know what seems like a relatively small conference starts to expand exponentially in terms of the things you have to manage or be aware of so what is it like for you kind of learning all of those waves of how to manage things and what advice would you give someone on how to pay attention for how much these things kind of grow well, it is definitely a learning experience. And for us, it means a lot of lists right now. So there's lots of, of spreadsheets happening behind the scenes as we look at all the different offerings that are available and we're starting to just prioritize what is really important to us. So is it in a booth experience, right? So we could give each of our members for instance, a booth, so they have sort of a home during uh, during the Congress. Is that what we need to do? Or is it more important that we have chat rooms and little breakout sessions available running throughout so that people can connect that way? It's it's looking at all of these things that we hear from these different companies when we're when we're meeting with them and saying, 
that's really cool. Do we need that or do we not need that? Does it add to what we're doing or not? And there is no limit right now to what you could potentially do online. Uh, we met with a company that recently did a launch um, for a, a product. They work with a lot of for-profit companies, obviously. And so one of the things that was part of this Congress was actually, you know, an image of this, this um, product going to space. So, you know, and it's traveling on a rocket and there's all these um, visuals behind it as you see this progressing and, and, you know, so there is no limit to what you could do potentially. Um, but do you need to do those things? Like they're cool to look at, but it's really going back and trying to prioritize. For us as well, it's like we are learning. So we don't want to make this too complicated for ourselves to the point that we won't know what to manage when the days actually happen. So where do we actually need to spend our focus? How much support are we going to get from, from the vendor that we're using? What other kind of external contract resources do we perhaps need to bring in to help us manage? There's a difference in a facilitating um, a live event versus facilitating something that's happening virtually. We find that that's a slightly different skill set. Do we need to bring other people in uh, to complement what we have been able to do with our team previously? And it really is, it's just a lot of learning right now and a lot of asking and a lot of listening. Dave has been really good and um, responded to some of my questions. He gave me some really good advice in terms of um, however much time you're going to think this takes from, from your perspective and your team's perspective to get this up and running, double it. <laughs> um, because it is really complicated, especially the first time as we struggle to figure this out. But I still think we'll have a good event at the end of the day. This we're determined to make this happen well. We'll learn some lessons along the way. I think that our members, because they know that this is our first time doing this, will also be very generous with their kindness to us. And I anticipate the same will be true for you. We're just to our best. We'll listen to them as we go as well and try to give everybody the best experience, but also learn as to what we could do better next time. I also learned a good piece of advice, which was don't think of this as a one-time deal. Like we have to do this this year because of COVID. It's like, how will this change how we work moving forward? And what lessons are we learning and putting in place for how our organization is going to change? And it doesn't mean that we're not going to meet face-to-face. -face. We definitely will because we're huggers. And you know we need to, we need to do those kinds of things and have those kinds of interactions to build our community. But how else can we use this really important lesson we're learning now to supplement what we do on an ongoing basis, even if we are allowed to continue to meet in person in the future? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, certainly, your thoughtfulness and the consideration you're putting into the setup put you in the best position possible for that event. So I hope I'll get to check it out in October and, and spend time with you there. Um, your comment also makes me uh, want to thank and apologize to Ben on our team. Uh, the, you know, the, the more I learn what it takes to convert an idea into something that functions virtually, the more I really learn what that transition is like. And uh, Daz on our team, uh, Daz and Ben worked together, um, described these virtual environments as like the matrix. Remember that scene where Neo's watching the code screaming down, uh, streaming down, and it's literally like that. And so taking something physical and trying to put it into a streaming code uh, is, is uh, complicated to say the least. So uh, Ben, thank you for your relentlessness <laughs> in doing all that. Um, I see Kristen joined us. Uh, Kristen, I just wanted to say hi and acknowledge your comment. Uh, so nice that you're here with us. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Oh, uh, about create, uh, curious about creative sponsorship benefits for virtual platforms. Yeah, a question we get asked a lot. Um, I would actually divide it into two categories and maybe Nick, you can take the handoff um, from this. But uh, Kristen, I would ask if you're considering a physical environment where sponsors have already been engaged and they have expectations in a physical sense, 
or if you're starting from scratch in a virtual sense, because the answer will be really different. Um, if you're talking about a sponsor who has expectations for a physical event, um, we'll then have to do some really creative um, comparison. You know, what is an equally or equivalent, equivalently meaningful benefit or engagement virtually um, is a very different conversation than if you start that conversation from the beginning to really ground the sponsor and move into something to create it that way. So Nick, I don't know if that helped or made your response harder, but uh, please take it from there. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I can take this in a couple of different directions. And Dave, I just had a funny note for you apologizing to Ben for throwing ideas out there. When I was in Ben's shoes before, we had words for you, but it wasn't something nice. So um, uh, jokingly, no, I, I, but I get it. I, I do it all the time now too. Now that I'm on the other side of the fence, like we can do this, right? People look at me like, Bro. I think, I think Ben just found a new friend to commiserate with. So it's all good. We've all, it, it, it is what it is, right? It's like, it's what you don't know. Right. Um, but anyways, back to the question at hand about the sponsorship side of things and creating different benefits for them, virtual platforms versus in-person events. The, the number one thing is the, sitting down with the sponsor, the client, the supporter, wherever it might be, and sharing with them what they're going to get out of a virtual event. Um, but so, you know, generating leads is usually the number one thing I hear from people, the amount of people that come in and out of their booth, the things that how many people they can see download their, their information, uh, and be able to see the contact information of that person in case they want to follow up afterwards. I know some of that stuff definitely, um, depending on where you're at in the advocacy world, nonprofit world, what type of information can be passed, can't be passed, that type of stuff you have to be careful on. But again, that's where you sit down with the client and have an understanding of what's going on. Um, as far as the, the in-person into the virtual stuff, there's an opportunity here to not just, when you're building packages, right? So one of my responsibilities in a past life was building packages. You can take something that might've been from an in-person event, it might not be a part of the virtual side, but you can incorporate into a larger package that includes something else outside of the virtual event or tie it into it, okay? Um, there, there's different things, there's different ways that you can play around with it. Um, for example, um, working with certain pharmaceutical companies and other companies that love to get patient feedback or survivor feedback, maybe tying in some sort of focus group that you might not have in the virtual event, but you can set up the sign up page or announce the sign up within the virtual event. So there's ways that you can really intermingle different things and think outside the box and I think I would say too, from a virtual standpoint, don't be afraid to think outside the box. Um, I, I think it goes back to what, what Dave had said too, those that are just so focused on the in-person side and haven't gone virtual that yet. It's back to the comment of making fun of Dave there for a second. You know what you know, it's not what you don't know. So I would just stress, think outside the box. Um, but as far as you know, the, the big benefits to the virtual side, when you're just talking about the virtual event, it's leads, people coming in and out of their booth, and even to how long people have been in their booth. So being able to, remember my comment of reporting, reporting is crucial and to be able to show those types of things. Um, so different packages around, around the reporting side, getting leads, um, branding and all the promotions previously, because this way you're getting brand awareness and spreading the brand uh, message, not just to those that are attending, but to your audience previously as well they're giving more exposure to your audience. So there's those components to look at too, to kind of package it all together. Um, in, in the publishing world, where I came from in the marketing world, there were three different areas to look at. Lead generation, uh, brand awareness, and thought leadership. So building a package around those three items is key. And when I say thought leadership, the ability to have their own webinar or their own presentation during the virtual event. That's something that, you know, just like an in-person event, I know uh, sponsors want to be in a, 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 have their own presentation. Of course, you have to be careful. You just kind of give the reins over to a sponsor. Sometimes you kind of have to coach them and say, hey, don't have this be a complete product pitch. It has to be relevant to what the audience wants, right? So there's different things you have to massage and work with there. But I would suggest build a package around those three areas. Again, it's lead generation, thought leadership, and brand awareness. Uh, br brilliant. Um, Nick, Kristen, I'm so grateful you threw that comment in. That was perfect time to join and thank you for that. Um, we've got uh, just over 10 minutes left and I want to save a few minutes at the end uh, to give attendees a view of this conference and how to interact with it um, for, uh, for all the different exhibitor booths and resources. So if I can ask maybe in just a minute or two for each of our panelists and why don't we start with Lorna and Krista and then Nick. Um, 
what is something, Lorna, that you hope, you know, after October and after your conference comes together and an attendee walks up to you, can you sort of think about what would be most meaningful to hear from them? Or what are you hoping that you're setting up now that will really impact somebody in a way that you care about? So hopefully, I mean, for us, it's really, I think, hoping that we continue that family or community spirit, that we don't lose something just because we've gone virtual that we still feel connected and people still feel involved with the coalition and feel like their voice is being heard and um, that they're still able to, to participate in a family reunion. And for us, it's always, that has just always been a priority. Yes, we have important learnings and teachings and coming out of this and we anticipate that that will not be the issue. We, we think we'll be able to nail that one. It's really, can we maintain the community um, especially in light of how things have changed in the world this year, because we actually think it would be a very important thing if we could get together. If anybody needed a hug, it's right now, right? So um, how do we actually then make sure that they're still feeling, you know, the love and, and the, the friendship coming through on top of these important learnings about our disease and uh, the needs within our community? Am I next or Krista? I'll jump in. Since Chris, I Krista, 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 same question for you. Um, in, in all of this development work that you're doing, what is your hope, your aspiration for people that have joined one of these? Uh, I, I hope that at the end people are actually ha have a good time and that they think that it was totally worth it and that they come to realize that there are things that work better in virtual form and things that work that don't work better in virtual form, but that I, I'm, I'm hoping, my long-term goal is I'm hoping that virtual conferences become an option that people will consider from here on. Because up to two months ago, you know, at least in my academic world, yeah, you could hear some voices claim I've been, you know, advocating for virtual conferences for a very long time because of climate change. But, uh, you know, people were like, oh, okay, fine. Nah, nah. But, you know, there's no way that they were going to switch, to change their physical conferences. It was not going to happen. But, and suddenly this year, you know, for bizarre reason of COVID-19, uh, we, there's this weird opportunity for people to actually try to make this work. And I, I, I'm hoping that this will work well enough that people from here on will actually start considering it as a, as a viable alternative and start meeting maybe every other year. You know, one year they do a physical conference, another year they do a virtual one instead of doing physic, flying people all over the world all the time. Uh, reconsider the frequency of those virtual, very large physical uh, conferences that are so bad for the for the environment. And and so that's. That's my goal is that this will stick. So I, I'll say I agree with both what Lorna and Chris to say. I'll take a little bit of a different approach to this is when you're going to ask somebody to sit in front of their computer for a day or two days, they better have a takeaway afterwards and learn something as well. I think it's extremely important that if you're going to put something on and people are gonna take time out of their day to sit in front of their computer like we are right now, that people can have tangible takeaways that they can implement in what they're doing. Um, that's, that's crucial. Uh, I agree, we wanna keep that camaraderie and everything else going uh, because without it, we have nothing, I, I say, um, but you still, people at the end of the day need to have a takeaway uh, and stuff that they can implement in what they're doing. I love those. And if I could ask uh, everyone in the audience, uh, based on the takeaway comment, if there's one thing that you felt, meaning how do you feel from being with us for this session, or one practical takeaway um, that really changed your thinking or impacted you, uh, please share that in the chat bar. Uh, I'm curious, I'm hopeful that some of the things that we covered were really meaningful. Um, and really, Lorna, I thought you said so exquisitely, um, not losing community and family and connection. You know, I think so much of this has been how we still feel close to all this. And so I want to thank the panelists before I switch to do the demo. Uh, I want to thank the panelists. 
Um, and I'm going to switch to the demo view so uh, the panelists can drop off. But uh, everybody, please uh, join with me in thanking our panelists, uh, not only for sharing your knowledge and expertise, but just how authentic and genuine you were in doing it. So Krista, Lorna, Nick, thank you all very much. Um, and I'm sure we'll stay close through all of these virtual events going forward. Thank you all. So thank for you. everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for everyone else still on just in the last few minutes, uh, what I would love to do now is to share my screen with you. Uh, and you're probably going to see my speaker notes from the, the beginning of the session. So I apologize for that. Um, but I just want to take a few minutes and walk you through this COVID advocacy exchange. And so we've spent now the time together in this auditorium. The navigation bar here at the top of the screen is how you navigate around through this conference. And so this is the main gathering room. Uh, anytime you come into the auditorium, you can click on the screen and see the live sessions. So this is the one that we're in right now going virtual. And then if you scroll down, you'll see the last session we did last Thursday, coalitions and collaborations. Uh, you can click play at any time and watch this 24 seven. So this session is available now, uh, anytime you can come in and watch. And then our first one, which was welcoming everyone and launching this uh, advocacy exchange program, uh, this was our first panel. So you can click on the speakers, you can watch, uh, hit play and watch the session. Um, and as we move through the next two months, each of these sessions will be uh, here and accessible at any time. Um, the next area that I was really excited to share with everyone is the exhibit hall. And so what you're looking at right now is the exhibit space in this conference area. And Bristol Myers Squibb is the first booth. And so you can click on uh, their booth. All of this is interactive content. So you can see a list of videos. You can peruse a list of documents. Uh, click in to check out any of these resources. Uh, and this is true for all of the exhibitors in this space. Uh, and if you go back out to the floor view, uh, Grit, this is our booth. I did want to mention that um, we created a presentation last year from our global virtual cancer conference and it's chocked full of uh, engagement statistics and analytics and things we learned uh, insights from our post session survey uh, all of that is available so please go in and if you're looking at you know things you can learn about doing a virtual conference that's all there for you and then all of our speaker booths uh, from uh, organizations around the world. Let me slide my screen down. Uh, you can just slide right to left or back and forth, and you can see all these great advocacy organizations, the resources they provide, and then following each one of these live sessions going forward, uh, we'll encourage our advocacy organizations to be actually at their booths so you can interact live with the organizations. So uh, if you don't have a booth and you want one, uh, just give us a call and, or contact us and we'll add it for you. And really excited to continue building this out together. So if I leave there now and go into the lobby, this is the main entrance space or gathering space. Um, and whether you're looking at this for uh, being an attendee at a conference or setting up your own virtual conference, uh, these are great spaces to show who your partners are, um, you know, to give them a feel for how to connect and interact within the virtual conference. You can click on info here and go straight to the information desk. Uh, these are all great places to learn how to navigate, to ask questions, to interact. Um, and so re really a ton of things here to get familiar with and to play around with. So uh, we encourage everyone to uh, take some time to get familiar with it. Um, just wanted to see before we wrapped up if there was any comments here in the bar. Uh, looks like uh, thanks and congratulations to our panelists. So uh, love seeing that. If there's any questions we've missed, uh, please feel free to email our team um, at, with GRIT or you can visit our website, grithealth.com. Um, anytime that I uh, have a hard time in the moment trying to connect with what I want to share, um, it's uh, always helpful for me to return to purpose as a grounding point. Um, and if I reflect back on two, almost three months ago, I remember how terrified I was what COVID would do to our organizations and our ability to fulfill our missions. Um, and I remember that it, it made me not only remember how I felt as a patient, but how I felt as a caregiver and really craving the ability to help people and to move forward and find answers. And that feeling is what has stayed with me through all of this COVID experience, 
Um, and it is a, it's a feeling that we all feel at different points and in different ways. But my, my purpose, and I hope our collective relentlessness, is that we not only get through this, but we inspire each other, we empower each other. And when we get to look back on this moment in history, we are proud of what we were able to do together. So I will leave you with those words, uh, my humble gratitude, um, and I hope to see you on our virtual platform and all of these other ones that are happening around. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone.